Grandmaster Horton here. I talk about other systems and styles all the time, but I rarely really break down who we are and what we do. So today, that's exactly what I'm going to do. The American Shaolin Temple was founded February 12th, 1979. Originally, it was a group of veterans that got together at the Veterans Memorial Building in Sentinella Park, what is currently called Edward Vincent Jr. Park in Inglewood, California. These veterans will get together, exchange stories, train together, continue to practice what they learned in the military um, during the Vietnam era. And then eventually they got older, they had families, they had children. Some of the veterans began to bring their children with them. That is when Grandmaster Griffey had the idea why don't we train the children as well? Why don't we pass on all these training methods, survival methods that we learned to our next generation? You have to remember this was in the end of the 70s. Tail end of the 70s, you're talking about the whole militant movement. The nonviolent civil rights demonstration era had ended. People were now very militant. You're talking about where we're looking at the assassination of all the civil rights leaders. We're looking at the Black Panthers Party being invaded by the FBI. You're looking at people who are angry and no longer feel that they have a voice, a public voice being that represents them and their interest. So there were a lot of these schools that opened up. American Shaolin Temple happens to be one of them, and it happens to be one of the oldest surviving schools from that era. Now, fast forward into the future. Grandmaster Bobby Parker, the original first generation Grandmaster, he was, his system was praying mantis kung fu. He was in the Marines. Grandmaster Griffey, Navy fought in the smokers, dealt with a lot of issues in the military, and he trained in a system called Tailua Kundo, Shotokan, Judo, and Taekwondo, and Shaolin Kung Fu under Richard Kwon in Chinatown, Shotokan under uh, Esper Frank Davis Jr. while he was in the military. He gets out, he trains yours truly. I'm the third generation Grandmaster. And so I want to make sure that the world knows these men lived and died. None of them were Japanese, Chinese, Asian. All of them were ge gentlemen from the community in Inglewood that just wanted to make sure that the community could defend itself no matter what happened. Because at that time, there was a lot of belief about the race war. There was a lot of belief about uh, you know, Jim Crow coming back. And so people want to be able to do something that allowed the community to be empowered. Fast forward to now. American represents freedom, liberty. Shaolin. The word actually means young forest for those of you who don't know. It does not mean kung fu movies. It does not mean flying through the air. It does not mean punching and kicking. The word Shaolin means young forest. It refers to the location of the original Shaolin temple. It simply describes where it is. And then temple. Obviously, since we teach publicly, we're not talking about a religious school. We're not talking about a Buddhist monastery. So why do we use the term temple? Well, considering our culture, American culture, the term temple is typically used not religiously, but referred to our body. Our body is a temple because we have a very strong Judeo-Christian foundation here in America. Our constitution is based upon it. So when you look at that, then you say American freedom of liberty, Shaolin, young forest, temple, human body. So anytime you liberate your body anytime you demonstrate the youthful potential and unlimited potential of say a forest a forest can grow indefinitely if you don't cut it down it spreads it grows tall it grows wide that is the idea every time we say the American Shaolin Temple we are talking about the freedom and the liberty for the unlimited potential of the human body to be expressed. That's what the American Shaolin Temple is. So we cannot be confined to a system. We cannot be confined to a sense of regular traditional values. We have to be allowed to grow and to flourish. So I will teach Karate, traditional. I will teach Shaolin Kung Fu. I will teach Jiu Jitsu. I will teach Eskrima, kickboxing, all kinds of things. Why? Because it's not for me. It's for the individual that is practicing. It's for the student that is learning. This is your journey. It's what works for you. It's for your growth. My whole thing is to give it to you straight and to make sure you understand the truth and to make sure you go deep enough that before you discount something, you actually comprehend it. See, that's my biggest issue for those of you who go, well, your school is MMA. No, it's not. No, it's not. 
When I learned Shorin Ru, I learned from a Shorin Ru instructor. When I learned Jiu Jitsu, I learned from a Jiu Jitsu instructor. And each one of them individually had to verify that I had mastered their system after decades of work, decades of private instruction at their home. I could not say, well, I got my black belt in karate, so now I'm going to take six months of you know, jujitsu, so now I'm a black belt in jujitsu karate. And I, no, you're not. No, you're not. Any more than you could go to college and say, well, what did you major in? I majored in college. Okay, but what subject did you major in? Stuff, college, everything? No, you didn't. It means your, your understanding is so shallow that you are not competent in any field. And that is the concept of saying I'm a mixed martial artist. Now, the concept of a mixed martial arts tournament, that's good. Because it says everybody gets to test and see how true their system is. That's old. That's not new. But to say I'm a mixed martial I have a black belt in mixed martial arts, that's stupid. How do you have a college degree in just stuff? You have to major in something, otherwise your understanding is extremely shallow, which is why you have so many big mouth young people in that field that are very arrogant. No, it takes time to master something. Do you actually understand the intricacies of that punch, that kick? Do you have a philosophy that governs it? And that's the real thing that's missing from martial arts today. Everybody has the how, nobody has the why. When you study Kung Fu, you have to understand that on a human body, you're talking about hundreds of acupressure points, hollow points, striking points. Why? Because the monks were not allowed to kill. They weren't allowed to poke eyes out. You could not do any damage that you could not undo because you incurred a karmic debt because the practitioners were Buddhist. Now, fast forward to Karate and Okinawa. The movements are extremely simplistic. Why? Because you only had one shot at cracking a samurai's armor and killing the man before his sword came down on your head or across your neck. So when you threw that reverse punch, the original name for it was not reverse punch, it was heart punch. And when you hit someone with a heart punch, the intention was to crack the samurai's armor, break it open, and break open the rib cage and stop the heart behind it. When I gave, when I talk about the reverse punch, where the first two knuckles are aligned with the wrist in a straight line, people go, oh, well, you'll break your hand. No, you won't. That's a lie. Nobody's ever broken their hand from throwing a proper reverse punch. The practice was designed for breaking through samurai armor because anybody who's ever broken boards, which they do in karate for this very reason, the board has a grain. Just like when you cut steak, it's got a grain. You break with the grain. You align your knuckles to the grain of the board. Well, samurai armor, was plated. It had these plates either going vertically or it had these slats going horizontally. The most common design was the horizontal slats. When they started doing that, the reverse punch was developed. Because if I punch this way and the grain of your armor is this way, I can break through it with one punch and I might be able to break through it enough to crack a rib and to cause damage to the heart. And that was the original intention. So because the Okinawans knew, they didn't have a whole lot of opportunities. This guy was highly trained, he was fast, he was on horseback, he was armed with weapons, but once we got him in those rice paddies, all that armor, all those horses, slowed way down. So I could rush him and hit him, boom, one good time. That's all the chance I got. And if I hit him and I did it right, fight was over. If I did it wrong, it cost me my life. So the movements, and that is why you'll notice the Japanese stances are lower than the Okinawans, because the Okinawans were in rice patties. They had to stand taller. Taekwondo does high kicks. And people go, oh, they do high kicks for show. Yes, today. But back then, that's how you, dis do you got somebody off their horse when they charged into battle. You're a peasant on the ground. Warlord charges in, he's on horseback. You want him off that horse, you jump up and you kick him off. And you better not miss. So understanding the historical and cultural aspects of what you do the philosophy behind what you do is what makes it effective when you remove the philosophy then yeah it does just become a dance and a joke and anybody that's been hitting a heavy bag for nine months can take you out because the comprehension is not there so that's why i'm doing what i do i'm trying to make sure the comprehension is there the american shaolin temple is about taking the human body and liberating it like a young forest, unlimited potential. Be Shaolin, be unlimited, be young, in here, in here, at all times, and growing and developing. Because remember, every redwood tree started off as a seed.